And um, I think that this will be pretty fascinating to you. Are you going to talk about what you've done? You did the, the project with the tents? No, we have to be shot. Sure. I'll talk about Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> I found that really pretty fascinating. Uh, but uh, uh, Greg Vanderbilt is uh, from Princeton uh, University. But he also uh, was instrumental in forming a company um, called Nova Metrics. And um, they, uh, what, what both, uh, I guess you have a lab there at Princeton or a group. Yeah, and, and, uh, and dealing with data and really making a lot of data make sense on some very practical things. So, um, um, how long have you been in Princeton? 25 years, I thought it was a long time, yeah. And his, his name is Dutch, but he doesn't speak uh, Dutch. So we, our Dutch contingency is in the back corner here. So uh, you guys compare notes of where you, you came from. All right, so uh, here's the mic, and uh, I'm going to get your presentation. Thank you. If you could do that. The, um, I, I think the goal of the of of my my talk over over lunch here is simply to uh, be a little provocative, in the sense of of presenting to you ways that we think about big data, and how we think about what oh okay um, how we appro approach problems what big data the that over term overused term really means, um, and uh, how uh, my company has uh, sort of uh, sort of approaches many of the more intractable problems that have previously defied solutions and which we're now beginning to address through various uh, data fusion and integration methods that fall under this broad classification of big data. Why do we want big data? Why do we want to have a big data approach? Uh, my company constantly gets calls from organizations and everyone wants a dashboard, right, with real-time data. And uh, they don't always know what they want to do with that dashboard, but somehow there's this sense that if you have near real-time data coming in in a dashboard, that automatically translates into enlightened decision-making. And uh, we actually are uh, have a policy now where we do not like to provide dashboards, data dashboards, unless we have an analyst integrated into the process. Um, because uh, a lot of what people talk about or think about with the data is, a, is, is really, um, what they don't want is data, okay? What they really want are data products. They think it's data, but it's really data products. And in my previous field, when we talk about, let's say, earthquakes, I want to know where all the earthquakes are occurring for a risk. The location of an earthquake is not data. That's a data product. Okay, the data is what's is the is the measurement of ground motion acceleration that's that's coming off the sensor as some as 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 an electrical measurement. That's the data. The, the actual location of an earthquake, the time of the earthquake, the size of the earthquake, all those things that people think of as data, that's, that's developed from with an algorithm that's continually going through revision, through the collection and integration of data, through applications of formulas, and from people working together in a collaborative fashion to come up with an estimate of what th that... Okay, I'm sorry, of what that... Um, you, you don't have a... This sort of feels awkward. <laughs> um, uh, so I think we have to be careful in differentiating what we mean by data, especially when people talk about near real-time data and what people really, uh, what we really should be referring to as data products. Um, uh, the the issues that uh, my company deals with and the courses I teach that we deal with and the ones that um, have been brought up in this discussion, and that is this issue of of water and water resources, I'd like to discuss that in the larger context of natural resources. And I'd like to discuss the natural resources in the context of economic development and stewardship. So how do we maintain our natural resources and at the same time promote economic development? 
and that's the larger umbrella under which most of these discussions are really taking place. Why do we need to address this? Why can't we look at these um, questions in isolation? I suspect that uh, particularly the next generation of people 20, 30, 50 years from now who will be working on development issues, aid and development, will look back at this time and say, yeah, they had a lot of data, they just got the, they just got the approach wrong. They were following sort of this, well, a lot of aid and development comes out of the health industry and health and medicine comes, the holy grail there is the evidence-based medicine or the RCT model. And in, for us who work in, in the, more in the space of environmental resources, we're used to not working so much in that evidence-based RCT kind of model, which is driven aid and development. We, we're more used to working in the concept of a systems approach or an ecosystem approach. And so that's what I'm talking about here, is sort of approaching these problems through a systems approach, not through the RCT model. And for those of you who have been in areas that have, you know, where there's a lot of development going on, which is where I've spent a disproportionate amount of my life, um, <coughs> you find that when you go to these countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, areas of Central America, South America, you are walking across areas that are just littered with feel-good exercises. Um, Engineers Without Borders, a group that I uh, support strongly, is one that's always burdened with this. The new gadget, the new water pump, the new straw for, for, for you know, improving uh, drinking water. You know, oh, we think if we just have a little gadget, we have a new development, we have a new innovation, that all of a sudden we can get to, we can, we can, we can apply that and it will solve the problem. There's no sense of an exit strategy. There's no sense of a sustainability. When people come to me, students come to me, engineers without borders, they say, oh, I want to go to this area and I want to put in solar panels so people can recharge their mobile phones and that's going to promote development in this area. You know, and it's going to be, and, and I say, okay, that's great. You come back onto the Princeton campus, two weeks later, you get an email or a text or a telephone number, telephone call and someone says, hey, our solar panels were stolen. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going back? Are you going to get on a plane the next day and bring those solar panels? Because if you don't know how you're going to answer that question, don't go. The idea that well maybe doing something is better than doing nothing that's not true. There's a moral hazard, and all of these countries are absolutely littered with good intentions, feel good exercises, foundations. One of the one of the biggest ones the. The transport, I'm going on with this. This is a lunchtime talk, so I, I, I'm allowed to do stream of consciousness. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and also you can see I've set up my slides for the attention span of an undergraduate student, so you're not gonna see, you're not gonna see any logos or dynamics, although I did, I originally started off with some serious eye candy here, but I knew I couldn't compete with uh, uh, some of the stuff. You can go to our website and see all that stuff. Anyway. Um, this is most, mostly me just pontificating on what I've learned in terms of the application of data and where I think are the great opportunities and how we should be approaching the problems. Um, and that is we have to move away from um, this concept of the one-off. Look, we all look at big problems, right? And we think, oh, big problems, we want a big solution. Well, guess what, okay? Big problems are almost never solved by big solutions. They're almost always solved by lots and lots of little solutions, and each one of those solutions has to be customized for the environment in which it's gonna operate. And not just the natural environment, but the social, cultural, economic landscape, just as well as the environmental landscape. I started with this as my introductory slide, my title slide, to make the point. You know, there's never been a famine in democracy. In India, the, uh, the monsoons would fail, there'd be a drought, the crops wouldn't cut up, there'd be a dam. Millions of people would die. We forgot about the, that level of tragedy that used to occur. What may have solved the famines in India probably has less to do with our improvements in water management meteorological assessments and predictions of monsoons. It was probably due to the end of British rule. So if we have this sort of phenomenon, and we're 
concerned about drought, we're concerned about water use. We can't be looking at it in isolation. We need to take a holistic approach. We need to take a systems approach. We need to take an approach that's going to be sensitive and nuanced to every particular social cultural environment in which we expect that solution to operate. That is a tremendously exciting, challenging, and horrendously difficult problem. And it's a problem with a huge long equation. And that long equation is full of variables. And we can't, we don't have the luxury of optimizing any single variable in that equation. We have to optimize the overall equation. And that is inherently a big, big problem. And so all of what we're talking about is a big data problem. I don't care if you want to measure that. It may not be large volumes of data, but it's certainly going to be people talking about the very needs of data possibly. There's probably 50, but I don't know. Um, you know, what they what we're talking about here is the integration, a holistic approach, a systems approach. Um, Most of the problems that we're dealing with are what we refer to as wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that I will talk about later. Uh, wicked problems are problems that defy solution. They're inherently dynamic. You may not even understand them. You may not have the capability of understanding them, but yet you have to address them. Poverty, conflict, use of natural resources, all of these are wicked problems. They, 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 they're composed of a series of variables causal relationships, underlying causal relationships, no single suite of which is diagnostic, but which mutate and change depending on the environment that you're in. They combine in certain ways they lead to like green respiratory extremism, outbreaks of infectious disease, shortages, droughts, famines. Okay? Famines are not caused by a crop failure. They may just as much be caused by a political okay. um, So all of this is a sense of what we're trying to find out wicked problems. Wicked problems, because they defy a single solution, are inherently well suited to the approach of an ecosystem approach or system approach. Um, <coughs> my former part of what I did with Ersco was related to Neon. A great example of that is earthquakes. We've solved the earthquake problem. States. Nobody dies of earthquakes in the United States. Or people die from Indonesian blind courts that die from earthquakes and then law darts. People can cause relationships, risk of death. Earthquakes are not even on the list. Okay? So you know, that's something I would never say at the USPS. But how have we how have we solved your <laughs> Okay, we do not understand what causes earthquakes. We do not what understand what triggers earthquakes. Okay, but we understand the ecosystem in which earthquakes occur. Mm -hmm. We know where the faults are. We know what the plate motion is like. We can measure the strain accumulation on those faults. We have all this research that is ongoing that allows us to characterize the ecosystem in which earthquakes occur. As a result, the U.S. Geological Survey and other groups have produced these highly accurate maps that present in probabilistic terms predictions of expected ground motion for every area. That, that assessment of expected ground motion presented in probabilistic terms allows us to apply solutions such as insurance and building codes that have effectively solved your problem. Yes, very few people will die from earthquakes in the United States, and the economic losses associated with earthquakes can be absorbed with the financial markets. Okay. It, doesn't, it doesn't diminish the fact of the research, but we've been able to address the problem without without specifically understanding exactly what it is for a hit on the relationship. So I'm trying to introduce that as a way to say, you don't always need to, uh, to understand the underlying causal effects in order to solve the problem. To some degree, we find oil as well, right? We don't want to go out there prospecting oil. We never measure oil correctly. We find an ecosystem, we find an environment in which we expect oil to occur. The geologic history and the structure we go drill sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So you can solve problems, perhaps contractable problems, highly heterogeneous complex problems, without completely understanding. But by taking a systems 
approach, characterize it and understand the ecosystem in which they operate. Again, inherently the big data and all these problems. My company is Delta Metrics, and this company uh, I created it formed out of a, uh, a series of seminars, research seminars that I was teaching in the GSI department at Princeton University. It was called uh, Climate Poverty Conflict. We were looking, we were using very advanced models on, on changes in climate, and we were projecting these around the world, looking to understand changes in growing seasons, soil moisture content, uh, related assessments associated with where the uh, food shortages, food shortages, and uh, seeing if we could then predict how the impacts of climate change would affect our various areas. We found it to be a very strong tipping point in, in vulnerable areas around the world. We started doing research at the same time. We found out that the same vulnerabilities, that all these populations that were vulnerable to climate change, guess what? They were vulnerable to lots of other things. Right? Just as we say the poor are, are disproportionately impacted by climate change, the poor are disproportionately or disproportionately by the election. I mean, when you start looking at causes of death and take a holistic view, you know, an election can kill as many people as a drought. Um, and the number one cause of death in most of these areas is, is actually religion. Um, anyway, we started taking this holistic view. We got a research award from the um, uh, Secretary of Defense, and we used it to, um, to start predicting areas that were to conflict as breeding grounds for extremism, and our assessments turned out to be pretty accurate. And so it ended up being uh, supported by the Department of Defense. And now we're moving into aid and development, um, where we've actually been moving, working with groups who are, who are concerned about uh, shortages associated with um, uh, malnutrition for children, stunting, and uh, groups that are looking investment groups that are looking to identify environmental and sustainable economic development projects in developed countries. And uh, the reason I'm here is that I'm, you know, we're also looking to develop relationships with this community. In the sense of community that we started with, but uh, I'm always looking for new opportunities just to be involved in groups that are working on um, scientific-based issues that have sociocultural and economic obligations. So um, I'm always looking to partner with other organizations, and I'm always looking for talent and always hiring. Um, this is a, uh, I want to start with this picture because this is, uh, this is a picture that's less than 100 yards from my office. And this is an office in my office in Georgetown. This is the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. That's a key bridge in the background. This is the waterfront area of Georgetown. This is some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Um, it's populated by uh, some extremely influential, wealthy people who um, gather in this area enjoy, and enjoy the Potomac. And it's also an area where I put my office, because I'm actually right across the street from a coffee shop called Bacon Wire which is a very disturbing coffee shop. It was a shameless excuse to provide recruiting so I could get more talented people to come work with. That's the only thing I can take credit for is actually being really good at attracting great uh, people. Like we all do, right? You might have people are smarter than you and you do as well. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, this is Georgetown. That's a town where we're actually grow on this river each morning. And uh, that's the, uh, this is the waterfront area where you can uh, have an $18 margarita or a $25 uh, cage free kale sandwich while you enjoy the Potomac. Uh, 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 what happens is uh, they very cleverly designed this so they have a series of seawalls that are actually built into the architecture. All you see are those little pillars. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this area. But in those pillars, between those pillars are actually walls that are submerged that can be raised if the water starts to flood in this area. So the water starts to flood in this area, and boom, up go the walls. Up go the walls, protecting all those 
real estate, all the restaurants and everything like that. And as the Potomac rises, uh, you can have this sort of infrastructure and, and part and away from it. Um, then what happens is after a while, if the walls are up and restaurants don't start complaining, so what they do is they uh, they go and they phone up the, the county in the area and say, hey, could you lower the walls, at least the ones in front of my restaurant, so we can see the Kennedy Center there in the background, we can see the river, and uh, we can continue to have and people want to come eat out at a restaurant. So they did that, and unfortunately, in this case, the person who was the last to leave uh, maybe turned out the lights, but forgot to put the walls back up. And so that half of the wall was left, and they found out that you really need all the walls closed. <laughs> so, so the area got flooded. Okay. But, okay. So, so this is one, it's, it's kind of kind of puppy, <laughs> um, kind of sad. Um, but also, just to point that, this isn't a tragedy. Okay, this is not a tragedy. Oh, yeah, sure, this is tens of millions of dollars of insured losses, and probably at least one person got fired. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no one, you know, there wasn't a migration here. There weren't refugees. Okay? There wasn't, this didn't institute, you know, uh, a historical cultural competition over natural resources or land that led to a war that created a series of refugees that escalated, right? Why not? Okay, because this is an area that has a tremendous amount of resiliency. It's a tremendous amount of resiliency in the fact that it has financial resources, it's insured, it had infrastructure. And also, this is one of these areas of the world where because of the expense of real estate, it makes sense to essentially party to try and mitigate against these types of natural disasters. And I think as everyone in this room knows, that's something we're kind of moving away from. It's less about mitigation, and it's more about adaptation, trying to make sense of what is logical land use. You know, maybe, you know, maybe waterfront property and flood zones are Floodplains are not a good idea to put highly expensive real estate. Maybe that's a good place to put golf courses. <laughs> yeah, but it's just more and more about just creative land use and, and less about this sort of old style party. So let me talk to you about how we approach our problems from the beginning. And, and this is a problem where, in this case, the example I'm going to give you is some work that we have done for. Well, here's the thing. We've, we've done this work for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, identifying areas that are becoming vulnerable as breeding grounds for extremism. Al Qaeda, but mostly their associates, Boko Haram, Al Shabaab. You know, what is it about these areas that support? What is it about this ecosystem that supports extremism and breeding grounds for extremism? We've also done this work for um, breeding grounds for outbreaks of infectious diseases. Specifically, Ebola. You know, what is it about how do you characterize the social cultural landscape that's going to make an area of the world to an outbreak of an infectious disease? Um, and then we've also done this for stunting of children. You know, what makes, we did this throughout Bangladesh to identify areas that were um, becoming vulnerable or, or where there mitigate and reduce the number of stunting that was occurring in children in nursery. And, uh, and currently we're doing this with human trafficking, and, uh, which turns out to be, I confess, I know I a massive issue uh, in, in Thailand and the Philippines associated with commercial fishing and agriculture, everything from shrimp to palm oil and sugar. <laughs> in essence, though, it's the same concept that has the holistic approach. And so I, I just like to walk you through it and show you a little bit of how it works. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is what some people think of risk, which I, I, I think everyone here in this room knows it's not. And that is simply the probability. So what we begin with is, well, what is the probability of an event that will happen? Well, 
let's say a plot of a graph, that's what I would be asking. Well, this is a really great scene, right? This is a probability. If an area floods and there's nothing in the floodplain, then what are we doing? We're just, just enhancing the soil. Right? We're just, it's, a, it's a completely natural process. If an earthquake occurs on the mid Atlantic Bridge, it's not a natural disaster. We're constructing sea floors, building mountains, we're shaping the landscape. All of these are natural processes that we can You know, some we choose to adapt to, others we choose to ignore. Right? Severe winter, we haven't adapted to. Water winter, we have. Winter in general, we have. One of the greatest adaptations we have is nightfall, you know, just because it occurs every day at very particular times, so we've been able to adapt to that natural process. But we can imagine if you were to switch earthquakes and nightfall, that would be, nightfall would be a really big uh, natural disaster. I mean, take, let's say earthquakes occur every day at a predictable time, oh, 6 o'clock, you know, time for the earthquake, you know, and there'd be a slight little ground motion associated with that earthquake. And we'd adapt to it. All our buildings would be set up to withstand it. Our, you know, our oak shells and our, and our columns would probably look like those on a boat, you know, with little rails across it. But, you know, but anyway, we would adapt. And then imagine once every 20 to 30 years, without any warning, boom, darkness. You know, would you would you buy headlamps for your car? Would you have? Would you want to use money that could go to school teachers and instead use that for street lamps? And who who would remember how to turn the street lamps on? Would they still work? And you know, and all that. So. My point here is not to sort of go off on as a tangent, but just to make the point that we're selective about what we decide to adapt to and what we decide to you know, consider to be a natural disaster. Most of it has to do with the frequency and severity of the event, and then it's permeated by our political institutions. We all know of many incidences where natural disasters actually enhance an area. In the U.S., it's very common for an area to benefit after a natural disaster because a new, it's, a, it's a large influx of money and renewal process and, and generally if you look at any kind of measure in terms of GDP, home values, etc., they paradoxically increase after, not immediately after, but a year after a natural disaster as all the infrastructure and everything is rebuilt. And certainly it's beneficial to any kind of political career. If you happen to be a member of Congress or a senator or governor or mayor, the natural disaster occurs in your territory, it's wonderful. Um, it's an opportunity to demonstrate leadership and Certainly, you're highly likely to be reelected with an ever increasing margin of public care. We've done studies and I've written articles on all of these a little strange phenomena, I'm sure. But anyway, this is just a probability event, which is a starting point. It occurs, and then, of course, the next thing. Oh, okay. Because there has to be something there. Okay, so it floods and all right, there's your house, or there's your crop, or some sort of income producing activity, population, livestock, crops, etc. This is risk, right? It's the product of the probability that that becomes the exposure. So this is how we actually calculate the risk. This is why um, in New York City, the earthquake risk is comparable to that of Seattle. Not because there's anywhere likeliest to be an earthquake in New York City as in Seattle, but there's just so much concentration of wealth in New York City that it has a comparable earthquake risk as Seattle. And that is in fact why earthquake in New York City has a seismic code, because it has high earthquake risk, even though it has low probability of earthquake. Okay? But then this isn't still the whole thing either. We can't make our decisions simply on this. So all of a sudden we have this kind of thing of resiliency. Now, using our analogy, let's say, probably a band drought and something happens, you have the elements that are exposed, but you have resiliency, which is generally, most people describe it as a population's capacity to absorb a disruptive event. I do this, I'm, you know, a drought occurs, or a flood occurs, my home is flooded, a flood occurs, my home is in the, in the area, and I'm flooded. But you know what? I have insurance. There's no real disaster, right? It's something I can recover. I can replace that car that I always want to replace anyway. And, and things get back and, and, and recover. But 
there's also the capacity to respond. Okay, event occurs, something's there. Let's say I'm not insured, but oh, I'm fortunate enough to live, be living in the United States, and therefore I'm, I'm covered through the you know, National Law Insurance Program, perhaps. But if not, certainly by federal disaster assistance. The president declares a federal disaster area. Money is built, and we're going to rebuild, right? Rebuild Jersey strong, rebuild Florida strong, rebuild Hawaii strong. We're going to come back, and we're going to rebuild right back here better than ever, right? No, no politician is going to come in and say, what will you people live here? <laughs> Why would you ever live here? <laughs> Don't you realize it makes no sense for, for this community to be here? You know, um, something happens. Right? So it's always going to be rebuilt. And a lot of times what will happen, and, and, and we're all guilty of this, we're guilty of that moral hazard ourselves, in the sense that we take an area that was in a 50 year floodplain and move it in, rebuild it, and re engineer it. And so now it's in a 100 year floodplain, or a 200 year floodplain. But if what we're doing is encouraging more people to move into the area, and more people move into that area, then we in fact have just increased the risk. Because we've increased the exposure, reduced the probability. So you have, a, you have a community that's in a 50-year flood. You build a new system. You reduce it to a 100-year But twice as many people move in. You're wasting your time. Now no, you're wasting your time. You use taxpayer dollars to put people in on this one. There's a serious moral hazard associated with communication. By the way, tragedy of the commons, right? This all might make sense for an individual town. But what happens across the country where you have hundreds and hundreds of towns that are all in the hundred year flood plan? You know, how often do you keep on doing this? What, what, what is the role of the federal government as the insurer of the last resort? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you have a problem, you have exposed, you have resiliency, and you have capacity response. If you're going to decide how to invest in an area, what makes sense, what strategy makes sense, you need to have policy. So how do you measure this? How do you quantify this? How do you, how do you come up with a predictive model and um, you know, systems approach, predictive model that you can iterate, ground truth? Um, all those concepts that I were here, I heard about this morning, and uh, and find a way to to make an informed decision, to improve your decision making you don't post the command. And it's big. Okay? You start estimating. What is it that determines resiliency? Well, it's a health of the community, it's a wealth, it's an education, it's a demographics, it's a type of government, it's the infrastructure, it's a natural resource, it's the alternative for increased activities. In the developing world, it's access to markets, all those sorts of things are what drives resiliency, capacity to respond, democracy index, all of them. That was that was India. Okay? In, in India, droughts were eliminated, not by changing the probability, not by changing the elements and slopes, not even changing by the resiliency. And one thing that happened was they changed the capacity to respond. They all of a sudden, when they had a British rule, they had a governance that was receptive to foreign aid and disaster relief and accountable to its population. Um, I give a sort of, um, not exactly accurate, but illustrative talk on how um, pornography might actually be the greatest benefit for the environment. Because if you talk about natural resources and removing conflict as a source of natural resources, then you're talking about uh, openness and transparency and freedom of press. What is the greatest driver of uh, communications right now over the last 20 years? Arguably the internet. What has been one of the major drivers? Internet in terms of uh, security paid over paid and, and what was the driver or the bandwidth for streaming video. Okay, there's an argument to be made that pornography has been a major contributor to environmental stewardship. Okay. So anyway, we're
Exactly. And, and you have to count, you have to look at this. This is all this is all equation where you have to evaluate this and you have to look at the risk and have to do the kind of analysis. Well, how do you do this? And uh, the way we do it is we borrow uh, methodologies that were used from my field of geophysics uh, from a field called uh, signal processing. And uh, what we use is something that we pioneered called weak signal analysis. And we believe all data has value, especially when it's combined. And a lot of times people say, oh, we can't estimate these things because there's no there's no big data or the data isn't sufficient for quality, quality you can validate it. Our solution to that is we just start bringing in lots and lots of data. And it's the it's the way that we use the same techniques we use to monitor or to detect the signal of a clandestine nuclear weapons test at the underground and what we measure to turn earthquakes. It's a way that we use to uh, detect a, a submarine uh, traveling under the Ar noise deep Arctic ice, the sound of submarine from the Arctic ice. And it's um, weak signal analysis is a little bit of essentially a variation on the processing. For those of you who have the iPhone 6, it's also that new feature that has the DD, the, the high, high res resolution photo. So what it does is it takes a series of pictures. Each single picture is a little blurry. Because if I take a picture of you as an audience, it's going to be blurry because a hand will move the buildings and the is vibrating between them, et cetera. If I take 10 of these pictures, that all of those little variations that cause the blurriness are going to be slightly different in each picture. But the image of each of you is going to be the same. It's going to be coherent. So because the noise is random, it will cancel itself out. Whereas the signal, your image, is coherent and will remain uh, the same. So what I can do is I can suppress the noise relative to the signal by doing that. This is also the technique that's used in every spy movie where someone is driving by and they're looking at the screen of the video and, and then the person comes up and says, they see the license plate and they say, oh, enhance that image. And then the, then the, the person at the, at the computer pushes the button and enhances the image. And you're always wondering, why did they just do that in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> it's like they had to be told. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, you know, what, they, what they're doing is taking a whole series of video images, each one of those frames, they're stacking on top of each other. The noise, the random, all the random motion gets canceled out. The, the, the letters of the license plate are coherent, you suppress the noise relative to the signal, and you enhance the image of the license plate. So it does really work. Um, well, that's, that's kind of the method we use. We get proxy measures for health, wealth, education, whatever we can measure. Um, land scan images are, are wonderful because from the, from the spectral images that come off, we can tell where I'm coming. We can tell population. As a matter of fact, we use ambient population because the number of people is now so accurate that the, it exceeds the area in which people spend the day. We do resolution down to one square kilometer. People move outside of a kilometer each day. So we use a measure of ambient population, which is the average number of people per square kilometer at any given time. And we can tell the crops that are being used. And we can tell the health of the crops. So also about going to a, an area we have a number of people, food production capability, calories available per person, access to roads, access to markets. All of those measures are critical measures without actually putting people on the ground, especially in database areas of survey data. Now we can combine that with survey data demographic data, we can say, okay, what's the population distribution of that area? What is the educational levels? How many dialects are there? What is the probability of people who randomly encounter each other to share at least one dialogue in common? We have dialogue and dialogue person measure. One of our biggest measures that we use for conflict that bubbles up an indicator is girls' school attendance. Uh, we find that one of 
the strongest indicators, one that always bubbles up into our, our assessments when we're predicting outbreaks of conflict, is girls' school attendance. And as a matter of fact, I suggested to several of our embassies that if they could just send someone out each day and just count the number of 10 to 12 year old girls who are walking into the school, that could be the most important thing we can do in terms of predicting an outbreak of conflict or a migration event. Why? I'm not sure why, okay, but in many of these cultures in which we're dealing with Sub Saharan Africa, the girls are the least valued member of the village. As a result, if there's any stress on the village, they're immediately pulled to the school to get water, to, to go to the markets, or to help other people, or to bring other. Um, you know, to bring other resources or engage in other activity. So the girls are essentially the canary in the coal mine for that community. Now, it's not a measure you would use in and of itself, and certainly by building more schools for girls, you're not going to stop conflict. Well, maybe you would, but <laughs> that would be a longer way from uh, uh, That would be a longer way from the solution. Uh, than, than what we do, but my point is, by taking a holistic view and by integrating all of these data and looking at these things that would be otherwise not traditional data types, you can find indicators that have a high predictive capability. Uh, and let's see what I So, uh, just schematically how this looks, is we take all this data, we, we get it from, I hope you remember that slide. That was it. <laughs> um, okay, we're really going to the wrong way. Is there a tool? So what you're doing here is 
you're creating, you, you reduce poverty and you promote environmental stewardship by creating a middle class. You promote know, a middle class through manufacturing. It's not through micro loans, it's not through one offs, it's not through call centers. Okay? It's not, it's, it's, through, it's through the hard stuff. It's through the hard stuff of identifying the natural resources, developing them in an environmentally sustainable way, right? promoting job growth, making sure that countries benefit from the value derived from our natural resources. And in the long run, when we look at what are the biggest threats to the population, okay, I'm 59 years old. In my lifespan, global population has already doubled. Okay, in my lifespan. So if we're going to look at what the overall environmental stewardship is going to be, we have to find a way to promote environmental sustainability. And I would argue that we can't promote environmental stewardship without looking at those things that cause people to degrade the environment in the first place. Because when you work in these areas, you are not going to get currency for environmental stewardship when people are facing the sort of conflict and poverty that they're currently facing. So what Greg has just put into the equation is that of all the data that gets collected, especially in the especially on the natural resources side, how much of it is, is, is data that relates to a decision and how much is going And so that's what you, what's interesting with Greg's work is that he deals more with the noise, I think, of how you eliminate that to get to what's an image, whatever you're trying to create is, just like the camera work. And, uh, and you, those illustrations he gave about detecting a, uh, a, a sober submarine under the Antarctic? Oh, the, uh, no, it'd be tough in the Antarctic. In the Arctic, <laughs> uh, they actually, you actually did that project uh, to develop the algorithms to, to do that for uh, the Department of Defense. So, what can be the applications of that in, in, in the natural system side of water and that type of thing? Can you take and eliminate noise, and uh, you're going to hear tomorrow from uh, Steve Bourne about the idea of someone sitting back there with Atkins, uh, and, and Steve has got uh, an idea that uh, he's working on in relationship to how do you create an app that would be a fun thing to do for citizens to detect sea level rise by standing in the water, pushing a button, all that goes to a information. But uh, how do you get rid of the noise? Well, you do it by you collect millions of measurements, and then you re reduce the noise, and then you'll get, be left with, with, uh, with maybe a measurement that's useful. Um, one, or, uh, one or two questions, and then we're going to move on to the next one. I have some question on the of an event. The water resources field, one of our biggest challenges is obviously the uncertainty in weather prediction, but more importantly, the non-stationality. Event, meaning previous information and now the future or the future. Can you elaborate on that as part of your techniques? How do you address that non stationality issues in the computation from climate change? When, when we've looked at impacts of overall natural disaster type events, whether it be uh, weather, earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, etc. There's no, it's, at first we thought, oh, it would just be, you figure out the footprint of the disaster. Right? You figure out the footprint, and then you apply that to the area where you think it's likely to occur. And then you measure the number of people with the economic wealth or whatever that's in that area. And that should give you a good first order assessment of what the overall exposure, risk, financial liability would be. That turns out not to work. It, it doesn't, um, as, as I said before, when you look at the global, the, the number one, the thing that correlates the highest with the number of lives lost from a natural disaster is not the size of the event or the population density in the area where the event occurs. It is actually the democracy index of that nation. Um, 
So in terms of an event where you can't assess it in probabilistic terms, or you, you think that it's not, it's not the, the time interval is known, if I understand your question, the time interval, the historical time series can be projected into the future. Um, I would look at just maybe not using the term prediction. <laughs> maybe talk more in terms of what people do of forecasting and saying this is there's a vulnerability in this area. Let's see what how we can best mitigate that vulnerability. It may be to resiliency. In some areas, resiliency doesn't make sense. It's just too expensive. You're much better off letting the disaster occur than having the resources to respond to. It's almost just an insurance. You can't you can't harden every every person against a natural event. Well, typically, we also do the concept of max study, which we look at a future state and say, okay, what if this happens? Almost like a scenario type of predi prediction as opposed to trying to predict it because it's so unpredictable. We try to envision some scenarios and say, if I have this at the sea level or five level, this is what the policy is implemented today. So we have it's almost like a scenario based planning as opposed to Exactly. That's 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 not how we would we, how we would approach it as well. We look at it as a scenario, and then set the and say what would be the impact on that area. We have to consider what well, we try and factor in the social elements, the economic elements, the political elements, etc. You know, because um, as I'm sure you're aware, people's response to risk is is not. It's not purely rational. <laughs> it's complex. Yes. Yeah. So I have a question. Have you found in your research um, any areas of the world that use their natural resources in a sustainable fashion to enhance the milk price? Um, th this is my number one. This was my number one find right now in Liberia. It's, uh, you know, it's a great nation. It's full of natural resources. It's models itself after the United States. Their flag is our, our reverse constitution. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's being, it's led by the first democratically elected female leader of any African nation. Um, it's, a, it's an outstanding place to work, tremendous natural resources. Right now, all the rubber is being, the fire stone dominates the rubber. It's all just extracted out. And, Pay two dollars a day, and um, so what we wanted to do is develop a big text processing plant. <coughs> very simple within Liberia. We identified the area, put it inside the university, uh, added a teaching lab and a, and a campus environment, we looked at all the security infrastructure, had our risk mitigation strategy all established, and uh, we were going to do that. Develop a uh, and the number one item, of course, was a was a very high volume item. Which had a permanent market uh, for the Asian development community that required a very little bit of latex per item. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it would be instantly sold. You know, that uh, but it was, it's really funny when you, as much as, and I think if what, what, what I'm interpreting your question is, is that there are a lot of, there's been a lot of talk lately about emerging markets and kind of investment. Trying to get into, into this area. If you look at what they're doing, it's kind of disappointing. It's mostly expansion projects and financial projects. And so there's almost, there are very few investors who are willing to do what's termed as a green field or start a project like this. And of course, in these areas, that's all you have. And, and the reason is because they don't have a way to do a holistic risk assessment. And that's, that's what I would love to do. And I think that would be a great challenge for us. Water is that? I mean, if you really want to make, if you want to really do a breakthrough in this area, you find a way to, to provide a roadmap so that all of this, there's tons of money, just massive quantities of money, people trying to get in the frontier of emerging markets. They say that, but it's not going anywhere because they don't have the, the roadmap or the skills to map out the risk assessment of the natural resources. So um, uh, very few, but this is, I love this part, this is one that is to us too. This is a massive data crunch operation. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you very much. In one sentence, if you get rid of the noise, you might end up with causal agents that you had no idea were even there of a problem to work on. Okay, the next uh, 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 group is something.